Good afternoon class. We're going to get started with our week three content. Looking at week three, we will go through the horse's anatomy and then the horse's conformation. <clears throat> when looking at anatomy, we're looking at the structure of a horse that is essentially the basic map of a horse's body parts. The term anatomy is objective with no judgment of the correctness or the quality of how those parts fit together. So keep in that mind that definition as we move throughout this lecture and then we'll compare that to the differences of confirmation in our second lecture this week. That being said, um, I inserted a cute little quote here to get us started that every experience in life changes the brain's anatomy. So it um, can be ever changing. To get us started, we'll discuss why is anatomy important. Your reasons will vary depending on your particular involvement with horses. However, basically a knowledge of the functional anatomy of the horse will give you the satisfaction of knowing your horse better. And in turn, you can better evaluate confirmation and the location of an industry. This injury. This provides you a background for communication with other horse owners, trainers, farriers, and veterinarians, especially with regard to the function or malfunction of the organs of locomotion, digestion, respiration, reproduction. And that being said, in the slides that I will be covering in this lecture, we will do more of a broad overview of anatomy. We won't get very specific into digestion and reproduction. Reason being for that is later on in the semester, we have a week set aside for nutrition and a week set aside for reproduction. During that time, I will cover the basic anatomy of the digestive system and also the reproductive tracts of the mare and stallion. And then finally, anatomy provides us the opportunity to be a better rider. By understanding our horse's movement, then we can in turn improve movement. Throughout this lecture, it will be laid out similarly. We will start with the parts of the horse and then we will look at the underlying bone. In looking at a couple of anatomical characteristics of horses, this is just running through a list of unique anatomy that our horses have. They have a highly specialized limb, each with one digit, which is considered the third, and with the main muscle mass of the limb situated close to the body's trunk. They have a large paranasal sinus within the skull. They have guttural pouches that are large out pockets of the artery tubes that extend from the nasal phalanx to the middle ear. They have a high crowned permanent teeth which grow for a long time, a feature used to determine the age of a horse. They have a simple stomach followed by a long intestine and a large complicated large intestine where fermentation of feed occurs. They have a well developed skin gland, a large heart and lungs, a uterus with short horns and a relatively large body, and a prominent depression in each ovary where the egg cells are released, as well as a large vascular penis and a complete set of male accessory glands. So just to go into some basic unique anatomy of the horse. Getting started with the parts of the horse, most of you I would expect are already familiar with the different parts of the horse, so I'm not going to spend too much time running through that. But we'll start at the top between the ears on the head where we have the pole of our horse. Then we have our horse's mane or the crest. Then atop the shoulders we have the withers, back, loin, and croup. So the withers, back, loin, and croup make up the top line of our horse. We then have the buttocks moving down to the stifle, the gaskin, the hawk at the joint, the cannon bone, the fetlock, then the pastern, and the coronet. Moving back up our front legs, we have the hoof identified, 
then our cornet, our pastern, and our fetlock is going to be the same on the front leg as our hind limb. Then we have our knee, forearm, elbow, arm, chest, point of shoulder, shoulder, throat latch, muzzle, and forehead. All of that being said, this is a broad overview. We'll cover this more as we go throughout the presentation, and we'll cover the specific area at which this uh, part of the horse is located. So this is just to give you a big picture before we get started. Now we have the underlying bones. So this photograph I, or diagram, I don't want you to memorize every single bone in here. As we get in the lecture, we'll do specific parts of the horse. We'll start with the head, then we'll do the top line. Um, then we'll do the the forelimb and the hind limb. So we'll we'll look at which bones you need to know. I'll let you know which ones are considered testable. Um, however, I did want to get you give you a broad picture and overview of the skeletal anatomy of the horse. There are twenty or two hundred and five bones in the horse's skeleton. So two hundred and five bones total. There are twenty bones in each forelimb and 20 in each hind limb. They are of great importance in health and disease since they are the form, the basis for locomotion. So that being said, the horse's skeletal system is composed of many interconnecting tissues. This includes bone, cartilage, tendons, and ligaments. The skeletal system of the horse has three major functions to protect the vital organs, provide framework, and support the soft parts of the horse's body. The length of the bones and the angles that they come together determine the horse's conformation, their way of going, their length of stride, and their athletic potential. So we'll talk more about conformation, but keep in mind that the length of these bones and the angles that they come together are going to help in determining our horse's conformation as we talk about that in our next lecture. The horse's skeleton has two basic components that are categorized as the axial skeleton and then the appendicular skeleton. The axial skeleton is made up of the skull, the vertebral column, the ribs, and the sternum. So that axial skeleton is going to be made up of the skull, the vertebral column, the ribs, and the sternum. And then the appendicular skeleton is made up of the forelimb and the hind limb. So appendicular skeleton is only made up of the forelimb and the hind limb. The horse's skeleton is made up of a combination of flat bones, long bones, short bones, irregular bones, and sesamoid bones. So the difference between these five types of bones that makes up the horse's skeleton um, are as described. A flat bone has a broad flat surface where the muscle can attach. A long bone are bones that contain the bone marrow and have two joint surfaces at each end. A short bone is a bone that is short in length. An irregular bone is one that does not have a specific size or shape. And a sesamoid bone acts in conjunction with the tendons and prevents tendons from coming into contact with the bone. Um, when looking at bones, there's a number of, of variables that come into play, and one of which is bone density. So I know a lot of times when I think of bones, I think, you know, there's, there's not development over time, and that, that's not true. Um, nutrition plays a role, age plays a role, growth plays a role. You know, lots of things play a role in the strength of our bones. Um, so that being said, when looking at bone density... Um, unlike changes that are seen in devel developing um, muscle structure, adaptive responses in bone are not visible to the naked eye. However, um, training will not visibly increase the size of a bone. 
It does improve the ability of a bone to withstand loading forces by increasing its mineral density over time. A common example of this is much like concrete and rebar. In a rebar and concrete construction, the mineral components impart a com compressive strength to bone, so it is more capable of sustaining the pounding of concussion and the bending forces created by angular rotation of limb movement. So as bone matures, the minerals are deposited into the bone at the expense of cellular fluid to occupy up to 65% of that space. When we talk about minerals that are deposited in the bone, we're talking about calcium and phosphorus. By the time a horse is fully mature, minerals make up 95% of the bone. The amount of these materials in a bone determines its bone mineral content. The internal remodeling process without changing the observable shape of the skeleton. However, these invisible changes in the, barn, in the bones greatly affect the strength and skeletal maturity of a horse. Bone in different parts of the limb has different properties. Um, for example, a cannon bone is stiffer than that of the long pasture bone, but subsequently it is not able to absorb as much concussion energy. This works well in that the cannon bone, being further distant from the point of ground impact, undergoes more bending forces, while the long pasture bone needs to be able to absorb impact loading. Being closer to the ground, the pasture bones more directly feel the energy of concussion. So as we get later in our slides and we talk more about the forelimb and the hind limb, then a lot of that will, will make a little more sense. But I just wanted to make sure that we hit on the fact that there are different bone types and that the makeup of bones is going to change over time um, as our horses grow nutritionally, as they're conditioned, and so on and so forth. So to get started, like I said, we're going to go with parts of the horse on um, one area and then we'll look at the underlying bones in that same area and then we'll move all throughout our horse. So getting started with the head of our horse, we have our pole. So this is the top of the head, center of the ears. This is the pole. Then we have our horse's ears. We have their forehead, their nostrils, and their muzzle. So those are going to be the different parts of the horse's head. One that's not identified here um, that is good to know is the throat latch. So there between our neck and our head where we're joining is going to be our horse's throat latch. As for the underlying bones of the head, just a few on here that I want to make sure that you know. So our upper jaw, we have our maxilla. So maxilla, you need to know that one. And then our lower jaw, we have the mandible. So those are the two large bones within the, the head. We have our maxilla and our mandible. A couple others that I want you to keep in mind are the nasal bone, the eye orbital. So the eye orbital is going to be located at the dark section. So right there where the eye would be, that's going to be the eye orbital. And then the teeth. So our molars versus our incisors. So the incisor teeth are going to be the teeth at the end of the nose. So those are going to be your incisors. And then your molars. So the molars are going to be our cheek teeth. So those are our molars. So to review the ones that you need to know and the bones you need to know of the horse's skull, we have the nasal bone, the maxilla, the mandible, the eye orbital, and then be able to identify the incisors versus the molar teeth. When we begin to look at the horse's back or the horse's top line, we'll start with the parts of the horse. Considering that the horse evolved to be a fleet of foot to outrun predators and did not evolve to support the weight of a rider, 
It is a wonder that horses don't suffer from back problems more frequently than they do. Yet there are often subtle problems that make themselves apparent to a absolute observer. Low-grade back pain can elect a variety of performance issues. So that being said, our horse's back, our horse's top line is going to be very important to their performance, to their travel, and to their usefulness. Our horse's back line is going to be numbers 8, 11, 28, 29, and 30. So at number 8, we have our horse's crest. At number 11, we have the withers. At number 28, we have their back. At number 29, we have their loin. And at number 30, the croup. So it goes crest, withers, back, loin, and croup. When looking at the underlying bones of the top line, this is known as the vertebral column. The vertebral column is made up of the atlas, the axis, the cervical vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae, sacral vertebrae, and then the caudal vertebrae. So to start off with our atlas and our axis, the way that I remember this is it goes in alphabetical order. So our C1, so starting at the top of our horse's neck or head, we have the atlas. Then when we move down to our C2 with our axis, it goes alphabetical order, atlas to axis. Um, following that, we have our seven um, cervical vertebrae, so our atlas and our axis are included within these seven vertebrae. Then the thoracic vertebrae, this is 18 vertebrae within this region. Then for our lumbar, there are six vertebrae within this region. The sacral, there are five vertebrae within this region. And the five sacral vertebrae are actually fused to form the sacrium. And then our caudal vertebrae are 15 through 21. So the vertebral formula of the horse is C7, T18, L6, S5, and CA15 through 21. Um, uniquely, there may be one more or one less thoracic vertebrae or one less lumbar vertebrae. This is going to be unique cases, so we're going to stick to our vertebral formula um, as listed at the top of this slide. Um, the latter condition has been noted in many Arabian horses, though. The vertebrae are irregular bones, and they come in various shapes and sizes. And except for the articulation of the atlas with the skull and with the axis, the bodies of the vertebrae are joined by um, intervertebral disc of fibrocartilage, and movements of the vertebral joints are dorsal, ventral, and lateral flexion and actually have limited rotation. The malformation of certain cervical vertebrae is one of the most common causes of wobbler syndrome, and this is most prevalent in thoroughbreds and quarter horse males, but it can occur in all breeds and both sexes. The local construction of the vertebral canal exerts pressure on the spinal cord, interfering with nerve impulses to the limb muscles. So all of this being said, um, we're going to take a closer look at these different type of vertebrae. So again, taking a co closer look at those different type of vertebrae. vertebrae. Our top left-hand um, image, we have the atlas, 
Then the right hand side we have the horse's axis. And then we're going to have um, our cervical vertebrae. So our atlas and our axis among five other vertebrae are going to make up the cervical vertebrae. Then we have the thoracic vertebrae. So it's going to be the bottom left hand side. You can view what the thoracic vertebrae is going to look like. Then we move into our lumbar. So the lower right hand side, this is our lumbar vertebrae. And then bottom um, center, we have five sacral vertebrae, and these five are fused to form the sacrum. So those five vertebrae are going to be fused to form the sacrum. Now we're ready to move on to the forelimb anatomy in regards to parts of the horse. We're going to start at the bottom with number 23. We have the horse's hoof. Then we're going to move up to number 22. This is the coronet or the coronary band. At number 21, we have the pastern. At number 20, we have the fetlock. At number 19, we have the cannon. Number 18 is the knee. Number 17 is the forearm. And those will be the parts of the forelimb you'll need to be able to identify. So from the bottom to the top, we have the hoof, the cornet or the coronary band, the pastern, fetlock, cannon, knee, and then the forearm. That being said, if you think back to last week when we did the um, leg markings of the horse, it'll complement itself when you're looking at those leg markings, where they lay, where they end at, is going to be these anatomy parts. So like our cornet, um, or for our, our leg marking, our cornet is going to be a thin white strip right at the cornet. Our fetlock is going to be midway up the fetlock. And same for our pastern. Our pastern is going to be midway or at our pastern level when we're looking at our leg marking. So a lot of complements between the two. If you know your leg markings, it's going to be beneficial in knowing your leg anatomy and vice versa. When looking at the underlying bones of the forelimb, before you get overwhelmed, um, just a couple that I want you to be able to identify. Starting, let's start at the top this time. So we'll start with the scalpula, the humerus, the elbow, the radius, and the cannon bone. So let's do those five. Make sure you can identify them. Scalpula, humerus, elbow, radius, and the cannon bone. So from this view, we'll be able to identify those. We'll dig a little bit deeper into the lower forelimb bones when we're looking at the parts of the hoof um, and specific bones located further down in our horse's anatomy. That being said, we're ready to look at our hind limb anatomy. So hind limb anatomy, again, we're going to do the same as we've done throughout and start with parts of the horse. Hind limb anatomy is going to be very similar to the forelimb. Um, we'll start at the bottom. We have our hoof. We have our cornet or coronary, band, coronary band. And then we move up to our pastern and our fetlock. Number 38 is going to be our cannon. Number 37 is going to be the hawk. Number 36 is going to be the gaskin. And then number 35, the stifle. So the differences in the hind limb and the fore limb are going to start at the hawk moving up. So the differences are 37 with the hawk, 36 with the gaskin, 
and number 35 with the stifle. Moving into our hind limb, looking at the bones. So again, don't get overwhelmed and memorize all of these. I will identify the ones that you need to be familiar with. Be familiar with the sacrum, as we already discussed that when talking about our top line. The pelvic or the pelvis bone. The femur, patella, fibula, tibia, point of the hawk, and the cannon bone. Anything moving further down the leg do not need to be able to identify in this diagram. However, we will go over um, parts of the hoof as well as the bones within the hoof later on. But for this diagram and for your forelimb diagram, you don't need to be able to identify further down than the cannon bone. So for this one, you have the sacrum, the pelvis or the pelvic bone, the femur, patella, tib fibula, tibia, point of the hawk, and the cannon bone. In looking at the anatomy of the horse's hoof, we could go on and on about the hoof for days on end. Um, that being said, we'll try to keep it short and sweet and just finish out this lecture um, for the hoof anatomy of the horse. But I'm sure many of you have heard the quote, um, no hoof, no horse. Um, without this solid foundation, a horse cannot perform to potential no matter how well trained, how fit, or how athletic one may be. A horse's hoof is a marvel in design, to say the least. Although seemingly a covering of dead tissue, the tissues just beneath the hoof wall are very alive, constantly remodeling to accommodate the changing stimulant. Nourishment of a horse's hooves comes from within, depending on good genetics, a quality diet, and adequate exercise. The type of exercise a horse performs and the terrain over which he is ridden stimulate surface changes of the outer hoof. Movement across the ground toughens the soles and cleanses the debris from the bottom of the feet. Excellent shoeing techniques are important to maintain healthy and sound feet. When we're looking at the hoof structure as well as growth, the hoof is an equivalent body part to a human as the horse's hoof corresponds to the last digit of the middle finger. It has evolved to support the full load of a horse as he propels himself across the broken ground, over jumps, spins, as well as turns. When we're looking at the hoof wall and hoof growth, so we can see our hoof wall is very well identified here. Um, it is going to be made up of the toll, the quarter, and the heel, but that is going to be our hoof wall. The hoof wall is composed of keratin. It is a modified extension of the skin, much in the same way that fingernails grow out from the cuticles. A horse's hoof continuously grows down from the coronary band or the coronet. A young horse's hoof is growing to grow much faster than a mature horse, um, but a mature horse's hoof growth is going to grow one-fourth to three-eighths of an inch per month. Um, an adult horse will completely grow out the toes within a year and the heels within four to five months. So each year our horse is going to have um, a new hoof per se. Hoof grows at different rates throughout the year depending on the season as well as the climate at which our horses are exposed to. It grows fastest during periods of warm temperatures and moisture corresponding with springtime and lengthening daylight hours. Um, so that being said, we have a little bit of background on our horse's hoof. So making sure that we're able to identify the parts we have at the top our horse's skin, so this is going to be um, our pastern. Then we have our cornet or our coronary band. Then we have the wall of the hoof. And then there's going to be the wall broken into different sections. So we have the toe, the quarter, as well as the heel. 
Now we are ready to look at the anatomy of the horse's hoof from the ground. So this will be as though we have our horse's hoof picked up, like we're going to clean out their feet. This is the view that we will be seeing. Um, on the left hand side, we have a hoof of the front foot, so a front limb. And then on the right hand side, we have a hoof of the hind foot, so a hind limb. Um, it's important that you notice that the hoof of the hind foot, so the one on the right hand side, is narrower and more pointed than the hoof of the fore front limb. So make sure that you can identify um, the difference between a hind foot and a hoof of the front limb. One should be able to identify the sole as well as the white line. Later on in the semester, we'll talk about different diseases and disease prevention in the horse. Um, we'll talk about white line disease, so make sure you're able to identify where that white line is. The bar, as well as the frog. And then on our right diagram, you can see the bulbs of the hills. So those are the parts you're gonna wanna be able to identify the sole, the white line, the bar, the frog, and the bulbs of the hills. In our first lecture when we talked about history of the horse, we talked about briefly how the at the end of a horse's um, long slender leg that they do have a natural shock absorber. So that is going to be the horse's frog. The frog of the foot is a V-shaped structure in the middle of the horse's hoof that helps absorb um, concussion and regulates the hoof moisture. It also assists the circulatory system by aiding venous flow of blood through a pumping action that occurs with each step. So the frog has many, many purposes for the horse um, and is very helpful and ensuring that our horses are able to perform their job and function correctly. Now we're ready for the underlying bones in the hoof and we're gonna work our way a little ways up the forelimb. Um, so starting at the bottom, we have our P3. This is the distal phalanx or the coffin bone. So when we're talking about laminitis and a horse that is suffering from laminitis, that's gonna be rotation of the coffin bone. In very severe cases, the coffin bone can protrude through the bottom of the horse's hoof or sole. So that is going to be P3 is our distal phalanx or a coffin bone. I'm gonna give you the scientific name and the common name. If you identify them either way, you're correct. Uh, personally, I, I tend to go with their, um, their common name. So typically I would call a P3 a coffin bone. Then we're gonna move into our P2. P2 is the middle phalanx or the short pastern bone, which makes sense because we're right there at the pastern of the horse. Moving into our P1, this is the proximal phalanx or the long pastern bone. So P1, long pastern bone, we're in the longer portion of the pastern. So it makes sense with our P2 and our P1, we have our short pastern bone and our long pastern bone. To talk a little bit on our sesamoid bones, because we did talk about how the horse has sesamoid bones um, throughout their skeletal system. Number 11, let's see, yep, there we go. Number 11 is a distal sesamoid bone or the navicular bone. So when we talk about horses that are suffering from navicular, um, we're discussing this little navicular bone down there in the hoof. And then number three, so number three up there at the top is going to be a proximal sesamoid bone. So a couple locations of where those sesamoid bones are at within the horse. I don't think we would be complete um, in looking at our limb anatomy or our hoof without hitting on tendons and ligaments. So what is the main difference between a tendon and a ligament? 
a tendon is going to connect muscle to bone. So make sure you write that down. Tendon connects muscle to bone. Like a system of levers and pulleys, muscles contract, transmitting their force through the tendons to the bones. With, with each muscular movement, connecting tendons move the bones to propel a horse along the ground. In design, the tendons withstand loading of a horse's mass on his skeletal system by dissipating concussion and strain. Tendons must be strong yet retain sufficient elasticity to deform and retain their resting shape and length. An example of a major tendon in the lower leg is the superficial digital flexor tendon. So superficial digital flexor tendon is going to be number five. So it is shown in the pink highlight on that bottom right hand photograph. So number five, the pink highlight is the superficial digital flexor tendon. This runs along the back of the cannon bone and connects the superficial flexor muscle of the forearm to the bones of the pastern. Another tendon that I have marked is number six. So this is going to be in the bottom right hand diagram highlighted in yellow. This is number six, the deep digital flexor tendon. So deep digital flexor tendon. Now we're going to look at ligaments. Ligaments, while of similar fibrous composition as a tendon, is less elastic. Their function is to attach bones to each other across the joint. So whereas a tendon connects muscle to bone, a ligament is going to attach bones to each other across a joint. Ligaments stabilize the joints from overstretching, overflexing, or twisting. An important ligament to an athletic horse is the suspensory ligament, which originates just below the bottom of the knee or the hock. It runs as a pair down each side of the cannon bone to the back of the sesamoid bones of the fetlock joint, where it then breaks out along each side of the pastern. The suspensory ligament takes a considerable amount of punishment during downhill travel, over jumps, and during sudden stops and turns. Other important ligaments include the collateral ligament that is located alongside joints, helping to hold them in place by limiting side-to-side -side movement. Collateral ligaments may be injured by abnormal rotation of the joint from a misstep. The only ligament that I have identified in the bottom right hand photograph is going to be number four. Um, it is highlighted in blue. So highlighted in blue, number four is the distal sesamoid ligaments. Um, that being said, when we meet in person this week, we will have a couple of horse legs that you can see the bones of the hoof and the forelimb. You can see the ligaments and we'll be able to identify those as a group. So that'll be helpful in making sure that you're familiar with a couple of tendons and ligaments and identifying them. This is going to conclude our 3A lecture over anatomy. Um, you're ready to complete your assignment and then get started with the next lecture on confirmation. That being said, I know we covered a significant amount of anatomy. I think a lot of the parts of the horse go hand in hand with knowing the bones. And even if you aren't a horse person, you're someone that's taking this class, um, just to gain more knowledge and have a diverse, diverse knowledge set, a lot of this is going to be similar parts as other species. So that being said, go ahead and get started on your assignment this week, and I'll have your confirmation lecture up in a little while.